Um, okay, so where were we? We had run this sim object and we printed this thing out, this hello world. Um, so what, uh, can you think of any problems if we were to put debug statements all over our code that were just standard C outs? Oh, you're like my undergrad class. You refuse to answer questions. <laughs> so, in our code, yeah, we had all these print. We had a print statement that just printed this out. What if we did this more generally? Like, use this for debugging. It could be slow. Yeah. So, if you have lots of messages, it's confusing. And if every object used this, then you know, every time you ran Gen5, it would just dump all sorts of stuff to the screen that you wouldn't need. So Gen5 has this really cool feature, um, debug flags. So if we look, um, so in debug help, we have all these different flags that we can use um, to turn on certain debug statements. Um, so for instance, things like the cache flag, all of these don't have descriptions. Um, let's see, a flag for memory accesses, a flag for the O3 CPU, and so on. So we have all these different flags. And so say we want to run, um, If we run simple.py, we can turn on a debug flag. Say we want to debug the DRAM uh, system. So we pass debug flags equals DRAM in and run this. And we see all these things dumped out from the memory controller printing everything that it's doing. Which is... Uh, really clogging up my SSH connection. Um, so I went through everything and you know, it's like these debug statements can be pretty um, detailed. Things like adding a read to the queue, request is scheduled immediately, not having to wait. Um, and so this is a way to only enable some debug statements, whatever debug statement you need. So let's replace, um, if we look at the tutorial um, file that we just created, source tutorial, in the hello object, rather than using a, a C out, let's use a debug flag. So we are going to use dprintf. So we're going to printf um, debug, and we need to define some kind of flag to use. We're going to use the flag hello debug. Um, so when the hello debug flag is enabled, we will print something. Let's print um, to follow my tutorial. Let's do created the hello sim object. So that's great. And if we try to build this now, we're going to get an error. Hello debug is not a member of debug. So we need to register this debug flag um, with the build system. So to do that, we're going to edit our scon script file again. And in here, we're going to add a debug flag. <coughs> Hello debug. So we're going to declare that we're going to use this as a debug flag, and then back in um, here, we're going to include debug. Hello. We're going to pull in that header file. And now if we run, hello, run, 
Yeah. Yep. Call this up. So if we rebelled, and Dr. Lok, this uh, hello debug.hh is created by scons. Yes, yeah, so scons creates this file hello.hh and also a cc file that defines things. So you see, so it created the debug hello.hh and it modified flags.cc. So those are compiling. Um, It compiled those, and we link. So then now if we run with the debug flags, this debug flag that we just defined, hello debug, we now see here, it actually tells us the name of the object that's printing this out is uh, created the hello sim object. So actually if we were to change this name, um, Fix tutorial. Well, we had changed the name of this um, the sum object for instantiating, and then run this again. I mean, this prints out the specific name of that object that we were using. Make sense? Okay, so I think this is mostly what we just talked about. We have to declare the flag, then we can use it. Um, so dprintf is the macro that you'll use most when doing debugging, but there's a bunch of other debug macros as well um, to do other specific things. Um, they're covered fully in the book online. Um, really, dprintf is the only one you need in like 90% of cases. Um, and then this, you can put any string there or any format string, so you can pass in, you know, you got percent %d, just like with normal percent out, or print out. Um, and we run it. Oh, a few other um, very useful options. So this debug flag option is an option to Gem5, not an option to your Python script. Um, debug start is a really useful option that says run for say a billion ticks and then start printing debug information. So this can be really useful if something goes wrong, you know, 10 seconds into your simulation. You can also say debug ignore, which then will print out, so I could do uh, debug flags equals um, hello, but ignore the thing that has the name whatever. So for instance, if I'm doing the memory, I could have one memory controller print out debug flags, but not the other, if I wanted to. So th th those are pretty useful. Okay, any questions about the debug flags? Cool. Dr. Yeah. is it possible to have debug pens printed within a certain range of ticks? Like this is a start tick and this is an end tick. No. You can stop simulation after a certain amount of ticks, though. <laughs> um, you could write that in your Python script, though, I bet. I bet you can enable and disable debug bot dprint app, or enable and disable a debug printing from Python. And if not, that'd be an easy feature to add. Um, so you could do it programmatically. Oh, I guess there, there's one other useful one that isn't here. You can also uh, redirect the debug to a file by saying debug file. Um, I have often, for things that I don't know where it happens and it takes a long time to get there, um, I've often redirected to a file which is actually a named pipe and then used grep to pipe into the, to, or grep to grep that named pipe to get only what I needed. Um, sometimes it gets complicated. Especially if you're debugging Ruby and something happens in the ancient past and you have to go through a million texts of all the detailed requests to get to figure out what happened. Okay, so next I want to talk about, um, oh, one more debug flag thing. 
So we looked at, uh, there's another useful debug flag. Um, the exec flag actually gives you details of the execution of your instructions that are going through the CPU. So this can be pretty um, useful if you're trying to debug your application in Gen5. Um, so this is showing like the, let's see, the move instruct uh, pop actually has, in x86 is three micro ops. So it actually shows you every micro op that's being executed. Um, when it executes and some details about what it's executing. For instance, here this is you know, the um, data is one and the address is um, something on the stack, it looks like. So uh, exec is a pretty useful um, debug flag. Okay, let's talk about event driven programming. So let's add an event to our hello object. Source. So we're going to add first a function. We're going to schedule this function to be called sometime in the future with our own event. So we're going to add a function and also. Um, an event. So we're going to use this event function wrapper, um, which was added within the last year, um, which makes making events much easier than it was before. So we're going to create, um, we're going to have this event. Everyone got this? Cool. So then in our C file, we just need to construct this event. It's going to add this to the constructor. Um, and we are going to use a C++ Lambda function. To simply call process event. And we'll look at this in a little bit more detail later. So the event takes two parameters, a function to call, which is process event, and then um, a name that you want to call it. So this is going to be called hello.event is the name of this event. So now we have this event constructed, um, but we need to schedule this event onto the event queue somehow. So to do this, we're going to add another function here. Called startup. Um, so startup is called the first time you call m5.simulate from Python, it will call the startup on all of the sim objects. So in startup, we're going to schedule this event to happen at tick 100. And of course, we need to declare this startup here. Um, and then so we're overriding the startup from some object. OK, and now we can recompile. Oops, forgot one thing. We also need to define the event, the function for our event. So 
we have process event is what we called it. And let's just simply print something for now. Do dprintf. And we're simply just going to print out that we're processing the event. Okay, now we can rebuild. This computer really should be faster. Okay, and now let's run Hello run. Oop. I forgot a new line. I'll fix that next time I go in there. So we have this printed out when we created the sim object, and then at tick 100, it printed um, that debug statement. So we enqueued that event. Now if we look at, we can also do the event. So you see when we created when we call it beginning simulation in 5.simulate at tick zero, this hello new name dot event was scheduled for tick 100. And then at tick 100, it finally executes. Any questions then? No? Cool. Okay, so let's uh, let's add a parameter though. This is kind of boring to just fire a tick at 100. Let's say what the latency is that we want to fire this tick with. So let's look tutorial. Let's look at the sim object config file, and we're going to add a parameter. We're going to add a parameter. ahead a bit. Is it happy now? So we're going to do, um, let's call this latency is going to be a param dot latency. We're going to create this parameter. Um, the type is going to be of type latency. So this means we could use something like two microseconds or one second as uh, the parameter that we pass to this. Um, the string is a help function to explain what the parameter is. Um, and we don't have a default. We could have had a default, like one microsecond here. Um, but for this parameter, we're going to have no default. It requires the user, when they're creating their config file, to specify what the latency is. So then in the header file, let's add a um, variable to store this latency. And then in the C file, we need to um, initialize it. So to initialize this, we can use params latency. So since we de define latency as a parameter in the sim object description file, in C++, we can now take this params object and get the latency out of it. 
and this latency type is automatically converted from whatever unit you put in to ticks, engine five. Ticks are whatever you set the tick rate to. The default tick rate is one picosecond. Um, you want ticks to be fine enough such that all your event times can occur at a tick, but not way too fine because then you're just wasting precision. And ticks can't be in uh, decimals like they can't. Ticks are integers, yes. Um, they're stored as a 64 bit um, integer, so you can have a lot of them <laughs> before you run out, uh, even using picoseconds. So yeah, the default picoseconds, I've rarely seen any reason to change that. Okay, so we have this latency that's passed in, and now instead of just doing 100, let's fire it after a latency. Um, so I'm skipping over a couple other details that I go through in the book as far as parameters go. Um, there's a lot of different options for parameters, and we'll see some other options as we go through the rest of the uh, tutorial today. But I'd like to be able to get to the mem object and hopefully the cache before lunch. Okay, so if we try to run hello run now, we get an error. The fatal hello new name latency is without a default value. So that means we need to go in to our config file and set I'm going to change this back to just hello. We can set that parameter. You can also do um, so you can construct it or, or instantiate your sim object and then modify the um, options. Or like up here, you can pass in any of these parameters as you construct the um, sim object. So these two lines are equivalent to doing. So now if we run this, now this fired at two microseconds instead of at 100 ticks. So two microseconds is um, the first three are pico, the next three are nano, so we have two microseconds. Any questions? Events make sense? You could also fire new events from within an event and we will see that um, later for sure. Uh, okay, so let's see. Let's make sure I covered everything I wanted to cover here. So we have this convenience class for wrapping simple events. And honestly, most of the events that you use are really just, I want to call a function sometime later. Um, and we'll, we'll see a more complex use of this where you can actually pass in complex parameters as well. Um, so I guess I, I'll say events in general are just a class which has an execute or process function defined in that class. Um, okay. So this is a slightly more complicated um, process event than what we looked at. Um, this actually went through and um, schedules a new event um, for some time later. So this is schedule takes an event to schedule and then an absolute time to schedule it for. Uh, you'll get an error if you make the time before the current time. You can't schedule events in the past. Um, so current tick gives you the current tick and then you can add latency. And there's a bunch of other um, helper functions as well that we'll look at. 
Okay, and then we talked a little bit about parameters as well. So this was looking at two different parameters. Um, latency is a parameter, in integer, you can have simple integers. Um, there are lots of other parameters as well, things like uh, memory size, so you can say megabyte, kilobyte, um, what else? You can have sim objects as parameters. So you can do param dot hello object if you wanted the hello object to have a pointer to the hello object. Um, and in the uh, in the book, I go through having sim objects as other parameters of sim objects um, with both a hello and a goodbye. And you can look at the it, it, it's in mainline Gen five now. Um, in part two, you can look at more complicated examples of um, this these sim object parameters and um, firing events. So, any questions there? Yeah. So, can you use this event function usually for um, the function that we might want to have in a frequency? Yeah, so if you wanted something to happen, say, once every, um, so you want to do like a, a one gigahertz once every nanosecond then you would schedule an event for one nanosecond in the future, fire that event, and then within that event, reschedule itself. Well, not reschedule, schedule again for one nanosecond in the future. So then that event will fire at every single one nanosecond. So do you usually use it for debugging? For debugging? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I mean, this is used for, say, you have... Um, so we'll look at this when we get to the CPU. Uh, you want to schedule an event to fetch at the next cycle. So you want to kick off a fetch. After you fetch the instruction, one cycle later, you want to fetch another instruction. Because your fetch unit can fetch at, one, at the rate of once per cycle. And so you'll schedule an event to start a new fetch one cycle in the future. Or, um, as we'll see in the cache in a minute, you receive a request from the CPU, but your cache actually, you're modeling a cache that takes uh, two nanoseconds or, or one cycle, let's say. You're modeling a one cycle cache. You get a request, and rather than just immediately responding to that, you'll say, I'm going to stall this, or I'm going to schedule an event for one cycle in the future, at which time I process the request. So you use this scheduling and events to s simulate system interaction and the physical time it takes things to. So, so if we, uh, for instance, in implement a structure like cache, uh, then, uh, for example, the replacement policy, so shall we take care of all these uh, cycles or so with the emails, or is it something that Gen 5 doesn't magically know? So Gen 5 doesn't magically do anything. <laughs> it's very much you have to do everything yourself. Um, so for something like a replacement replacement policy, I mean it's kind of up to you. Does uh, do you update? Let's say updating all your LRU information. Does that happen during a hit? Is your hit latency dependent on updating LRU information, or do you do that after you return the value to the CPU? Then you go off and on the side update your LRU information. And if it's the latter, then maybe you need another event to update the LRU information. But if it's happening in the same cycle as you're getting your hit value, then you don't need another event. You can just do it by calling a function. Does that make sense? Right, but uh, how do you know how many cycles does it take? So that's up to you. As the, um, so I, you're modeling a cache in Gem 5, you need to decide as a modeler, how am I gonna update my replacement policy? How long is it gonna take to access this cache? Um, it's completely up to you. It can be as realistic or unrealistic as you want, which is the power of modeling things in C++ is that you get to be unrealistic if you want. But then the downside is it's not like Verilog where you actually have a hardware model. It's you can make numbers up and be way off. You can have a eight megabyte cache that takes one cycle to access. Clearly that's un unrealistic, but you can do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you interpret two things one more time? 
The tick number? Yeah. I, I saw in the slide. I don't uh, Yeah, so let's see. Uh, so global frequency is set at one trillion quadrillion ticks per second. So that's one picosecond. Yeah, so this this is at tick zero. This happens. So at tick zero, we scheduled the um, event for tick uh, two million. And tick two million, when that occurred, the event fired. And the hello event exists at tick one eight four something. Yeah, so this is so this is event three, which is the. Um, the simulation limit tick. So it's kind of like, it's an event that's scheduled at the very end to always fire. And so it's scheduled at minus one. UN64 minus one is what that's scheduled at. So it's essentially just an event that sits at the very end of the event queue, always. So the difference between this number and this number is two million. Yeah, so this is a different event. That's an event that Gen5 automatically added there for us. That's the exit event. So it's kind of hard to see, but let me, I can fix this real fast. I needed a new line here. Actually, let me, um, We'll, res we'll schedule this up in again. Any other questions about this building? I have a small yeah. question. I'm really curious that it says event three. The name of the object is event three. So what is for two and one? one I one? don't know, actually. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good question. Oops. <laughs> It just kept so, so so that just kept rescheduling itself always. Uh, let, let's do this for um, this is what happens when I don't follow my notes exactly. Let's see what kind of mistakes I made there. I forgot to subtract one. It's an important thing to do. Okay, so uh, let's see. What else are we talking about here? Events. And next up are memory objects. Okay, cool. Than five eventually. 
I'm going to take in a million times. OK, any other questions about events or about parameters? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is this event class, does it uh, have any option for us to know if any other event has already happened at one specific time? I mean, um, for example, do, do we have some kind of data ready at the time because that event has been scheduled? Right. So, uh, no. To answer the question. Um, there's not really any way to know what events have happened in the past. But uh, what you do to accomplish you know, the modeling goal that you're kind of getting at is when data arrives, you schedule an event. So if you schedule your, um, say, we'll, we'll look at a cache in a minute, and we're going to have an access timing event. So when you get a request from the CPU, you schedule an access timing event for one nanosecond in the future. And that access timing event, when you're executing that, you know that you got scheduled because you had a request come in. So you just set up your um, code logic such that you know what happened when an event fires. Does that make sense? I, th I think it'll become more clear when we go through the cache example too. Okay, so to get back to your question. <laughs> so at time zero, we schedule an event for 200,000. Then at 200,000, we, sch we, sch we scheduled again for 400,000, or 4 million. At 4 million, we scheduled for 6 million, and so on. And then down here, it was really the problem was I was messing my new line. This event, this exit event, um, occurs at 18 whatever 615, which is when that event was scheduled. Does that make sense now? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. OK, any other questions? Cool, so uh, let's take another five, since you guys, I'm sure, are getting super tired of just hearing me drone on. Um, let's take another five and then come back at like 11.18-ish 